So common breast conditions. So proliferative disease of the breast, it's more commonly referred to as fibrocystic change. Now, this is what you don't want to confuse with fibroadenoma. Where fibroadenoma was our solitary lesion in young women under 35. It was mobile, rubbery, you know, solitary lesion. In contrast, fibrocystic disease tends to be bilateral and tender. So it fluctuates with the menstrual cycle. You know, a woman will get worried because she'll start feeling masses or cord-like sensation in her breast. It doesn't have to be bilateral, frequently bilateral. It'll worry her, but then she says it's painful. And we, and we like pain when it comes to breast pathology because painless is cancer. But she'll say it's tender, which means it, has, it renders pain. Changes with the menstrual cycle because it's estrogen sensitive, so it will tend to regress when she's menstruating. The apocrine metaplasia, apocrine glands, which you tend to see in the axillae and the pubic region, they like to mention apocrine gland metaplasia. Okay, remember metaplasia is simply one differentiated cell type converts to another differentiated cell type and it's reversible. So they'll mention almost like these sweat glands are appearing, these glandular structures. And what they like to do is to ask you which characteristic regarding the fibrocystic change most likely bears malignant potential. And they'll mention hyperplasia as an answer. They'll say hyperplasia. And they'll try to trick you that way because we know, for example, that endometrial hyperplasia, secondary to unopposed estrogen, increases the risk of endometrial cancer. So we think hyperplasia, yeah, sure, that could be an increased risk factor for malignant potential, but it's not. So if for fibrocystic disease, it's only dysplasia, okay, only dysplasia, which is still reversible, like metaplasia, okay, it's neoplasia that's irreversible. If they mention dysplasia, it's that characteristic that has malignant potential. Okay, so cellular atypia, synonymous for dysplasia, this is what has malignant potential. Acute mastitis. Now this will show up typically in a breastfeeding woman who has a cracked nipple with soreness and they'll want to know what the diagnosis is. It's acute mastitis. It's typically staph aureus, which don't forget is gram-positive coccus, catalase and coagulus positive. But staph aureus is the most common cause of acute mastitis. And one of the USMLE favorites is they like to ask the treatment for acute mastitis, and most students will select the answer uh, temporarily discontinue breastfeeding. And that's wrong. You need to know that you continue breastfeeding. And even more specifically, they might throw in his answer choices, continue breastfeeding from the opposite breast, from the unaffected breast. And they'll have as a second answer choice, continue breastfeeding from the affected breast. And the answer is actually you continue breastfeeding from the affected breast. So even though it does render some pain, the treatment is you continue breastfeeding. It helps clear out the infection. It doesn't harm the baby. So that's an important detail you can commit to memory. And recall that if they say peau d'orange, that's referring to inflammatory carcinoma. If they mentioned large epithelial cells with clear halos, it would instead be Paget's disease. So these are some differentials you need to bear in mind. Fat necrosis. So it's secondary to trauma and it's non-enzymatic. They like to mention a woman who's running and her breasts are rubbing against her bra and she gets this tenderness afterward and give you a situation where you need to infer that there's some sort of trauma occurring, such as working out or running. They're referring to non-enzymatic fat necrosis, which in contrast, there's the pancreatic enzymatic fat necrosis with saponification because you get the calcium deposition with the fat and you get saponification. It's the soap formation. So it's a whole different process with the pancreas, but for the breast, it's non-enzymatic. Now, gynecomastia is benign breast enlargement in males. You can see it physiologically in newborns because of the high estrogen content that crosses the placenta during pregnancy. You can see it in teenage boys going through puberty. The high testosterone levels with aromatization into estrogen leads to breast enlargement. You can see it in older men who have declining testosterone levels, so they get an increased estrogen to testosterone ratio and subsequent breast enlargement. So USMLE wants you to be familiar with some drugs that can cause gynecomastia. Now you've got spironolactone at the top, ketoconazole at the bottom. Spironolactone is known to block the androgen receptor directly, okay, so anti-androgenic effects. 
Ketoconazole inhibits the enzyme desmolase. Desmolase is in the adrenal gland. It converts cholesterol to pregnenolone. Pregnenolone is the precursor for cortisol, aldosterone. DHEA, dihydroepiandrosterone, is an androgen. Okay, so ketoconazole inhibiting desmolase can have an antiandrogenic effect. You also have marijuana and heroin, which have unknown mechanism as far as causing gynecomastia, but they are associated with it. Same as cimetidine. It might be related to its P450 inhibition. Digitalis cardiac glycoside is known to have antagonistic effects at the DHT receptor. And dopamine 2 antagonists, recall that dopamine has negative feedback on prolactin synthesis. So if you antagonize the D2 receptor, you're going to enable prolactin to be secreted. Okay, so dopamine 2 antagonists, these are antipsychotic drugs, uh, aka typical ones or neuroleptics, such as haloperidol, trifluoperazine, flufenazine, chlorpromazine, thioridine. Okay, so these are potential drugs that can cause gynecomastia. And alcohol, if you mess up your liver because you've been drinking, then you're going to have a decreased ability to metabolize estrogen. So same reason for the gynecomastia, you have the palmar erythema or the spider nevi. These are effects of the increased estrogen. The USMLE is pretty clever. The, they're really obsessed with the perineoplastic effects of lung cancers. Now recall that with small cell carcinoma of the lung, you might get ACTH or ADH secreted ectopically. With squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, for instance, you might get a PTH-like peptide secretion. But with large cell carcinoma, you can get a hyperestrogenic state and subsequent gynecomastia. So if you see gynecomastia in a patient who has lung cancer, this is an easy diagnosis on the USMLE, which will be large cell carcinoma. Prostatitis, exactly as it sounds, it's just inflammation of the prostate gland. And the USMLE wants you to know that it's most commonly a chronic A bacterial. They will just ask you directly. They'll say, what's the most common type of prostatitis? And they'll say acute bacterial, chronic bacterial, chronic A bacterial, and it's chronic A bacterial. So you can get this enlargement, this swelling of the prostate gland it can occur with BPH. But if you do have an organism involved, it's the same organism, E. coli, that you see causing UTIs, you know, cystitis, inflammation of the bladder in women. So E. coli, your gram-negative rod, fast lactose fermenter. This organism you would treat with trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or ciprofloxacin, a type of fluoroquinolone. Now, be aware of the small blue cell aspect per histological examination because USMLE will give you a vignette of a guy who's 68, he's had trouble initiating his urinary stream, and then they'll ask you for the diagnosis, and students will select BPH. Now, by all means, the guy is 68 and he has trouble initiating his stream, he probably does have BPH, but you won't expect a blue cell infiltration, which these small blue cells are leukocytes. Okay, you can get lymphocytes with chronic prostatitis present in the prostate gland, whereas simple BPH, you would just expect hyperplasia. So you'd expect increased glandular appearance of the gland versus just small blue cells, which would be prostatitis. Now with BPH, once again, uh, they'll give you an older man who has trouble initiating a stream or he has an interrupted stream. And they want you to know that it's classically enlargement of the transitional zone slash periurethral zone, which makes sense because it, you have trouble urinating, so periurethral. Okay, this is transitional. And in contrast, they want you to know that prostate cancer is classically the posterior zone or the peripheral zone. Okay. So you'll palpate a hard nodular appearance on digital rectal exam if it's cancer, okay, and that would be the posterior or peripheral zone. But if it's BPH, you're not going to get that nodularity on digital rectal exam because you're going to have a nice, large, smooth prostate affecting primarily the transitional and periurethral zone. So drugs that can treat BPH include finasteride. So what's the mechanism of action of finasteride? That's right, so finasteride is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, which that enzyme normally converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, the more potent form of testosterone. And DHT is implicated in the progression of BPH, so finasteride just decreases DHT synthesis. Tamsulosin and terazosin, what's their mechanism of action? So they're alpha-1 antagonists. 
Now, alpha-1 antagonists can have the dual function of not only improving symptoms of BPH, but they also can be used to lower blood pressure. Okay, so whereas you have other alpha-1 antagonists such as prazosin or fentolamine or phenoxybenzamine, which are primarily used for blood pressure control, tamsulose and terazosin have more of an effect on the prostate than the other alpha-1 antagonists. So these are traditionally the drugs that are used. Now on the USMLE, this will get you a point, is sometimes they'll list finasteride and tamsulosin as two answer choices, or they'll say finasteride and terazosin as two different answer choices. And they'll ask you for the treatment, and students will have no idea which one to choose. Now look carefully, because in the vignette, if they mention anything about the guy having increased blood pressure, and they'll casually say it. They won't even, like, make a point of it. They'll just slip it in there. They'll say, oh, yeah, his blood pressure, you know, is 148 over 86. And they'll want you to know that tamsulosin's a better choice over finasteride because finasteride's not going to lower blood pressure, whereas tamsulosin would. And BPH can also be associated with post-renal failure. Now, we don't want to get too heavy into kidney pathology here, but recall that post-renal failure, it would lead to a decreased osmolarity of the urine, so an inability to absorb fluids as easily, and you'd also have an increased sodium concentration in the urine. Now, one of the classic indicators of a pre-renal pathology would be a decreased sodium in the urine, so a fractional sodium excretion of less than 1%. This detail is actually tested, whereas post-renal, it's greater than 4% classically. If they mention anything about increased sodium in the urine or uh, decreased urine osmolarity, so uh, inability to concentrate the urine, then you could be thinking that this BPH has gone on to cause a post-renal pathology. Now, once again, this illustration can just reiterate the points that when you have enlargement of the prostate gland, it constricts on your urethra, this periurethral zone and ultimately you're going to have a decreased passage of urine. So this is very common in older men. Prostatic adenocarcinoma, so prostate cancer, once again, a posterior slash peripheral zone, palpated on digital rectal exam, not the transitional or periurethral zone. And the ultimate unequivocal highest yield point about prostate cancer is that it causes osteoblastic metastases. So they'll show you perhaps an x-ray of the pelvis or you know an abdominal x-ray and it'll just look hyper dense. It'll look very white. So if it's an extremely white x-ray, they're trying to show you that it's causing osteoblastic metastases, so increased bone density. Whereas lung cancer causes osteolytic metastases, okay? It causes hypodense or black lesions, holes in the bone. Multiple myeloma, once again, you'd expect lytic effects on the bone. Breast cancer can have both effects, blastic and lytic, but osteoblastic metastases specifically are associated with prostate cancer. Can you get lytic metastases clinically? Sure, okay? There's never 100% in medicine, but the vast, vast majority of the time, prostate cancer is associated with osteoblastic metastases, and this is what you need to be aware of. A radionucleotide scan of the bone would show increased uptake in the bone. That's another way that they could mention or refer to osteoblastic metastases, whereas a radionucleotide uptake would not be increased if they were lytic metastases. Now, I write here PSA, what's its usefulness. Now, I'm just going to put it out there. The absolute most important thing to remember about PSA is that it is never used as a diagnostic tool. If they ever ask you what should you do to diagnose prostate cancer, PSA is always wrong. Okay, you can't diagnose prostate cancer through PSA. It's had debatable sensitivity and specificity. PSA tends to be used more to monitor treatment, whereas if there's a remission of prostate cancer, we can see PSA levels fall. If they all of a sudden spike back up, it can help infer that maybe there's a relapse of the prostate cancer. Okay, so it can be used to monitor the treatment of prostate cancer, the progression of the disease, but it's never used as an initial diagnostic tool to say, yes, we have prostate cancer. You need to do a biopsy to show that you have prostate cancer, okay? Look at the Gleason scale, which is how you monitor that pathology. USMLE occasionally, not the highest yield information, but occasionally they will want you to know that free PSA is associated with BPH, whereas bound PSA is associated with prostate cancer. 
Now, those aren't like unequivocal distinctions, but occasionally it'll show up that there's a propensity for there to be an increased ratio of free PSA and BPH, where there's an increased propensity for bound PSA, an increased fraction of bound PSA, prostate cancer. And you can remember that because if you don't have prostate cancer, you're free, right? You're free of disease. So you have free PSA. Now, once again, this is, this will show you the histology of the gland here. Now, you have a normal stroma, and you have this prominent nucleolus to the cell. And in general, just be aware that if this were to be simple BPH, see all these lumina, these glands here, these clear circles? Now, if this were BPH, they'd be everywhere. Okay, so where I'm drawing these circles now be where you'd actually see these lumina if we had BPH. They'd show you a surfeit, this excess of lumina for BPH, whereas for prostatic adenocarcinoma, you merely have these neoplastic cells developing. Now for the flash quiz, a 68-year-old man has hesitancy urinating in a disrupted stream. He is afebrile, and a prostate biopsy shows infiltration of small basophilic cells. What is the likely diagnosis? Prostatitis. Now recall, if we see lots of small blue cells in our glands, in our lumina, that's prostatitis. 